Welcome to Forensic Science Sunday, where I tell you one true crime case that was solved using forensic science, all while doing, that's right, my makeup. Today's video will be featuring the Darth Vader palette from ColourPop and Star Wars collaboration. I'm so excited. <laughs> all the other products I'm using in this video will be linked in the description below. Please read the disclaimer. I am not a professional forensic pathologist, nor am I a professional makeup artist. I am just the average girl at home like you, playing in my makeup. Sometimes I do my nails while I talk about a true crime case. So if that's something you're into, then you're more than welcome to hit that subscribe button. Also, quick reminder, the comment section is a privilege. Sir, don't fuck it up like these guys. Now, let's get into today's case. Now, this story all takes place in the year 1991 in Minneapolis, where a man named Michael Provenoff, that word, Proven, Provenchikov, Provenchikov, lived with his wife Ellen and their two children. Michael, he was from Leningrad, USSR, so he grew up in that Soviet Union era in Russia, and it was a pretty difficult time. He grew up really poor and deprived of a lot of things. He grew up in the 1950s, 1960s, and um, it is said that he and his family lived in an apartment that had 30 people in the apartment. I've never heard of that. The apartment obviously is meant for probably just one family and Michael and his family was living with 30 other people. There were other families in this apartment that was for one family. Wow. It was really harsh conditions. I mean, they had to wait in super long lines for food and it was not even enough food. It was like barely enough. It was probably like just a handful or something. At the time, Michael and his family, they were living in St. Petersburg. While in Russia, Michael studied to become a dentist, but he was really bad at it, so that didn't work out for him. But going to school wasn't a total waste because he met his wife, Ellen, there. She was a dental hygienist, and she actually graduated, so she did really well in school. And they ended up getting married and having two sons. In 1979, when Michael was just 23 years old, he and his entire family immigrated from St. Petersburg's Russia to the United States. They ended up in Minneapolis. Now, Michael and Elaine, they got naturalized in 1983. I never even heard of that word, naturalized. I actually had to go look that up on Google because I've I, I didn't, when I read that in a sentence, I'm like, what, what does that mean? Um, basically, it means where they got accepted as citizens into the United States. When Michael and his family moved to the United States, Michael started working as a janitor, and he was a really hard worker. He was not the type to sit around. He really didn't want to have the same lifestyle he had in Russia. He saw this as his opportunity to change things around. Finally, he was in America, and he just wanted a better life for himself and his family. So Michael worked really hard as a janitor and he learned English by just listening to people and talking with people. Um, he made connections with people. Michael became quite popular in the Russian immigrant community. He met a lot of people who helped him out, you know, other fellow immigrants who came to this country and he learned a lot from them. He really listened and he learned a lot and he applied all of his knowledge to get to where he wanted to be. And it took Michael just seven years since he had moved to the United States and was a janitor to become a successful stockbroker. I mean, wow. Michael needs to come over here and teach us some, some of us Americans some few things. He really wanted that American dream lifestyle and he was going to stop at nothing to get that, to create that for himself and his family. At the time, Michael was working for a company called Prudential and he had an entry level um, position at this company. So he was just starting out, so he didn't have a lot of clients and customers. So what Michael did was he went to the Russian community and he asked his fellow Russian immigrants from the Russian community 
to help him, you know, if they if they would give him a job, if they would help him or be his client. And they happily obliged because if there's nothing, if you something you do not know about Russian people, Ukrainian people, they are very, very much very very helpful they really help each other out well i can't speak on the current events right now from what i know about russian people they really help each other out we have a huge russian community here in la my ex-boyfriend he is ukrainian and he actually introduced me into the russian community and from there i somehow managed to get myself adopted <laughs> to the russian community and um now like they kind of know me and they're just like, you're pretty much Russian. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, I would say 90% of my friends are either Russian or Ukrainian. I never really hung out with, you know, Russian people. They, I never really understood them. They always seemed kind of angry to me. I know it sounds stupid, but actually they're very, very loving, kind people. They always help you out. They are very, very tight knit. Okay. And they take care of their own for sure. So anyway, back to Michael and his story, because like I said, I always be putting my story up in here because I just can't help you guys. I'm like, blah, blah, blah. but back to Michael and his story. That's how Michael became very, very well known and successful in the Russian community. And he was taking these different accounts and stocks and working on them for his friends. And as Michael got more successful, obviously he bought things like cars and houses and new clothes and jewelry and Michael was really doing it up okay he was really doing it up and he was becoming a lot more confident because he had this new success and he would go around boasting to not just his friends but clients and other people like hey I got a Mercedes and this and that and I don't know why I just said that in, a, in an Italian accent yeah just scratch that I I, I sound like Tony Montana I'm, I'm so sorry um, anyway the people were starting to get quite annoyed with him like at first it was like okay dude like that's cool you got a Mercedes but then after a while people just thought it was very tacky because the people he was telling this to, they also had Mercedes and were pretty rich as well. So they were kind of just like, okay, dude, like calm down. I guess he was having one of those, I believe, I don't know what it's called. And like I said, I may have just made it up, but I feel like there's sometimes when people who don't have money get a little money or they get somewhere, they get this complex about themselves and they start to just like show off obnoxiously do you know what i'm talking about do any of you know what i'm talking about they're all of a sudden it's like oh i got a little bit of money instead of being like cool and chill about it and like okay cautious about it like okay i got money let me just keep going the way doing what i'm supposed to do and keep things cautious and being um humble about it it's like they get this ego boost and they just fly off the hinges and it seemed like this is what was happening to Michael so I mean Michael was making a lot of money he was earning one million dollars annually which is like wow even back then 1991 that's a lot of freaking money so um that's a whole lot of money actually back then that's a whole lot of money now <sighs> I kind of understand because I'm like okay I get it he worked really hard and he finally got what he wanted and made a life, the life that he wanted for himself. Who wouldn't be excited about that? You know, who wouldn't want to like show off a little bit? But to this extent is like too much. On January 28th, 1991, Michael phoned his wife, Ellen, to tell her that he was going to be late, but he was on his way home and it was around 10.30 p.m. However, when she woke up the next day, she realized that Michael had never returned home girl here we go alarmed she called the police to report michael missing police found michael's mercedes in a parking lot in Wayzata with his checkbook his credit cards his wallet um some cash inside police searched michael's vehicle but they found no evidence of foul play everything seemed to be in you know good condition nothing was moved but it was rather odd no one in their right mind would leave their credit cards checkbook and cash in their car overnight just sitting in some random parking lot like that doesn't make sense so 
police continued their search for Michael. They also found Michael's briefcase sitting on his seat. They didn't find any blood or any evidence that there had been foul play. And actually the night before, a police officer that was on patrol saw Michael's car sitting in the parking lot around midnight. He said it was around 1230. Police continued their search and while they were looking, they did find something that appeared to be blood on top of an area of the frozen lake. So they sent samples from the lake back to the forensic science lab, but unfortunately the test results came back inconclusive, so they weren't able to get anything from that lake. Who knows if that was blood out there or paint or ketchup or no. Two days later, a workman at a city compost saw a flock of crows kind of circling around this area where there was a bunch of Christmas trees that had been disposed of. And, you know, he went to go see what, what was over there that all these crows were um, circling around. I'm a little nervous. Oof, I'm scared. I don't know what to go find. I don't know what to go find. So he says that when he looked into the pile of Christmas trees, that to his dismay, he discovered a whole human leg. He said it went all the way from the foot up into the waist area. So it was the entire leg, girl the entire damn leg. I, I don't know if I could have said that so many other ways. It was his damn legs. Obviously he was traumatized. Like who's expecting to look in a pile of Christmas trees and find a human leg? Nobody. I mean, Merry Christmas, I guess. I don't know. Happy New Year. <laughs> According to this guy, he could tell by the leg that whoever the guy was, he was a rather large guy because he said the leg was really huge. Immediately he called the police because who finds a human leg in a pile of Christmas trees? Like just your, your everyday holiday season, I guess. What the F dude. Moments later after police arrive and they block off the entire area, they find a human torso. They also find another leg as well as the tip of a finger. Chow, I think I'd be freaking out at this point. They also find the severed tip of a pinky finger. With the severed pinky found at the scene of the crime along with scars on other body parts, police were able to identify the victim as Michael Provenichikov. They compared the pinky print to Michael's brokerage license and the fingerprint that he had on there and they were able to figure out that it was him. And as you can imagine, his wife was destroyed. She was absolutely heartbroken. Michael was a very successful, well-respected man. So police was trying to figure out who would want Michael dead. Investigators started to theorize that Michael may have been the target of some sort of racial attack because he was a Russian immigrant. So they started telling all of Michael's friends and associates like, don't come to the funeral because you're a friend of Michael's and whoever killed Michael could want you dead as well. So, you know, they were just, they didn't know what was going on clearly and they were just trying to take every precautionary level that they could to make sure that nobody else got hurt. Now at this point they still hadn't found Michael's head or his two hands. They just had that pinky finger and the two legs and the torso. So it was clear that whoever had murdered Michael or killed Michael definitely did not want him being found, did not want him being ID'd. With further investigation, police found out that actually a lot of Michael's friends, clients, wanted him dead. In fact, there were several different clients that spoke very poorly about Michael. One of these people actually told investigators that they wish they were the one who had done that to Michael. Oh my God, like are these people crazy? Like, first of all, <laughs> I mean, trust me, we all had those people in our lives where we're like, you know what, I could seriously wring their necks. But it's just a figure of speech. We're not gonna do it, we don't mean it. And for damn sure, I'm not gonna be saying that to police officers. Like, what, what's wrong with people? Why do they be saying this type of shit? So it's safe to say that Michael did have a lot of enemies. Um, 
he was not that well liked and well respected as it seemed. As you can imagine, this only broadened the list of potential suspects as his own friends, coworkers, and clients were saying these types of things about him. So police just had more potential suspects to look at, which really did not make things easier. Now, although Michael was a very successful man, he made a lot of money with his clients. He also was doing some shady-ish with his clients' money. Not everybody was happy with the way he did his business. One of Michael's former clients named Zena Sherl, she said she gave Michael $20,000, but she asked him to only invest in the stocks that she told him to invest into, to not touch the money. She said, do not touch the money. You only do what I tell you to do with these stocks, you know? She just wanted to make sure no shady business was going on with her money. Of course, Michael agreed. He was like, sure, yeah, of course. Like, I'm not gonna touch the, your stocks. I'm not gonna do anything to your money unless you tell me. Like, you know, I'm your, I work for you, so you're my client, so obviously I'm not gonna do anything unless you tell me. And Zena, she was pretty satisfied with his response, so she went ahead and she did do business with him. But Zena, she was a pretty smart woman and she always watched her money. And she found out not too long after that that Michael had been taking her money and investing them into other stocks. He had been moving them around and doing different things with him. I mean, as you can imagine, she wasn't too happy about that. And you dealing with people's money, you gotta be careful. That's why I get scared of like those type of jobs I feel like are very, very stressful because one thing people don't like you to mess with, they food and they money, okay? And when you start effing that up, there's a problem. That's why I think like the two most stressful industries to work in is probably the food service industry and financial industries where you're handling people's money like the bank and stuff like that. Those are two industries I feel like it's just the worst. Now, Zena, she realized this because the company sent her a bill telling her that she owed between eight and $10,000 for companies selling and trading stocks. Michael had been buying and selling stocks using her money. And this is something called, so Michael was doing something that was referred to as turning the account. Basically what that means is that he was buying and selling stocks in his clients' portfolios without their knowledge for the sole purpose of earning the commissions. So he was getting money, he was getting paid from the buying and trading, but he wasn't actually making his clients any money, which, um, yeah, nobody's gonna like that. He was also promising other clients that he would give them 18% of whatever he got back in returns, which is illegal in a lot of different states. And not only that, you guys, Michael was really bad at buying and selling stocks. He, I shouldn't say that he was very bad with stocks. He actually was okay, but although he was successful, he definitely was not good at every single spying and selling stock exchange that he did. There was a couple of ones that he really fucked up. Let's just say that. There was one particular incident where Michael bought shares in Texas Air for most of his clients. He bought them for about $48 a share. In just a couple weeks, those shares fell from $48 to $50. $15, you guys. I know some people was pissed. I would have been pissed. I definitely would have been pissed. So as you can imagine, with this type of shady business, a lot of Michael's clients weren't upset when they found out he disappeared or had been killed. They were like, oh well, good riddance. I would have done it myself. So police went back to Michael's wife because at this point they're all over the place. There are so many different, you know, suspects, potential suspects that it could be. So they went back to speak to Michael's wife. They wanted to find out what had happened the night that Michael disappeared. She told investigators that on January 28th, 1991, around 8.30 p.m., Michael called her. He told her that he was with a client and that he was going to be home 
you know, a little late. It's basically like, hey, you know, I'm with a client right now. I'm going to be home a little bit late, but can you get me um, my supervisor's telephone number? Remember, you guys, 1991. They didn't have cell phones, so he was most likely calling her from a pay phone or some sort of landline to another landline. So it's not like he could look in his phone and dial up his supervisor. No, he had to get the number. So he asked his wife to give him the number of his supervisor. And his wife thought this was especially odd because Michael was speaking in Russian and Michael only spoke Russian around other Russians because he thought that it was rude to speak Russian around non-Russian speaking people. His wife assumed that whoever the client was, they had to have been Russian. After speaking with his wife later on that night, he called his boss at home. He asked his boss if he could get $200,000 for a client that night. $200,000, bro, in one night? How, how do you, where, how? So of course, his boss was a little hesitant because, you know, it's in the middle of the night. You are calling me up, asking me for $200,000 that you need to raise for a client tonight. And Michael pretty much told his boss, well, yeah, my client is leaving early tomorrow morning and I really need to raise this money tonight. Obviously, his boss said no, because that is ridiculous. And his boss told him, like, it's not that we're not willing to help you out, you know, and to come up with that type of money for your client. It's just that we, we definitely can't do it in the middle of the night, like tonight. Then Michael said something really bizarre to his boss. He said, didn't you tell me that your father gave you $200,000 to help you buy a boat? And his boss was like, what? And he said it again. Didn't you tell me that your father, you know, gave you this money to help you buy a boat? His boss says he has no idea what Michael was talking about whatsoever, what he was referencing. He has no clue. And he was just kind of like, I don't know what you're talking about before the call ended and Michael hung up. Now it's time to go into the palette. But anyway, back to the story. Because Michael's boss never told him anything about no boat uh, that his father was helping him with, he just came up to the conclusion that probably Michael may have been trying to send some sort of signal of distress, like an SOS or something, by bringing up this boat. He wasn't quite sure, but he knew something definitely wasn't right about this reference. Now, the medical examiner said that she couldn't be precise when Michael was killed, but she knew it had to be later on that night because because his body parts weren't completely frozen so she didn't think he had been out there for that long oh my god I'm gonna need to use this because girl is we don't play with black like that now Michael's torso had been wrapped in tarp when they found it along with Michael's torso forensic investigators did find a piece of black hair the first thing that they needed to determine was whether or not the hair was human because the hair was crimpled, it was like kind of crinkly and crimpled, they just felt like there was, they just had an inkling that it wasn't human, that it was probably from an animal. Using microscopic testing, they were able to see that it was in fact an animal hair. It was a dog's hair because the center portion of a dog's hair, it's I believe it's referred to as the mandala, not mandala, but medulla. The medulla helps to identify that specific breed and they found out that the dog was a Burmese mountain dog or at least it was from some sort of breed of a Burmese mountain dog but basically there was one other piece of evidence that investigators found at the scene on the gate leading into the um, parking lot it had been broken open it appeared as though it had been hit by force like someone ran their car into it and broke the gate open and they did find a tiny piece of the front of what appeared to be the front bumper of a tanned vehicle they weren't exactly sure because obviously they didn't have any other evidence there was also some brown paint that was left on the gate from the car that had hit it now michael's mercedes was black it was not tan so that told them right there that somebody else was there that night 
Now, a witness did come forward and tell investigators that they saw Michael's black Mercedes parked to a brown or tan looking car in the middle of the night. The witness also told police that he thought the car could be a Mazda 626, which is a very particular car. I'm surprised he even remembered that but or he could see that but I guess if you know cars you know cars and this man knew his cars that's what it looked like to him but of course it could be any car so police started to look for a tanned Mazda okay so I've managed to get black all over my face I'm surprised I didn't get it in my mouth I look like I've been in some sort of fight on Mortal Kombat or something. This new information helped investigators narrow down their list of suspects considerably because now they knew that they were looking for someone who was driving a tanned Mazda, who was one of Michael's clients, who spoke Russian, and who also owned a Burmese mountain dog. So, I mean, that's a lot. That's a very particular type of person. There's a considerable amount of doubt going on right now in me. During their investigation, police discovered that not only did Michael have, you know, issues with clients that he was um, working with, he also had issues with an investment company that he was working with in Nevada. He had been listing investors to invest into a resort that he was building in Reno, Nevada. And when police went to check this resort out, they find that there wasn't really much of a resort at all. In fact, it was just like this deserted hotel in the middle of the desert. He was asking investors to invest into a company managed by Omni Financial. I mean, I feel like at this point, homeboy is just making everything up and people are buying it. You know, they're buying into it. It's just sad that he started out with this dream of like having a better life for his family and it went into greed. You know what I'm saying? Like if he hadn't gotten greedy, I feel like everything probably would have went okay. Well, maybe not, yeah. Probably would have did really well for himself. Not that I'm condoning his death or his killing or his murder whatsoever, because that's wrong. But obviously these stories are meant to teach us lessons. Yeah, I'm not condoning anything that, you know, happened to him. I don't think he should have been murdered for it, but it's a valuable lesson to learn. You know, don't fuck with people's money and don't fuck with people's food. This whole investment thing that he was doing with this resort was a huge scam. Obviously the investors that were involved weren't too happy about this. And so they also became potential suspects because they very well could have wanted him dead as well. And we're talking about people that have millions of dollars here investing into resorts, you know? That's not a little piece of money, you know? That's not like you stole five dollars from me or something. That's like you, you fucking stole from me. Like, you know, I can't even imagine. I am kind of been curious about con artists and scammers because I'm just, I wonder how they can get away with some of the shit that they get away with. Like, I really do, like, trust me, I'm like, it takes a really skilled person and a very intelligent person to get away with these things and a very manipulative person, but you just have to have an extraordinary amount of ego and confidence to pull off the things that I've been seeing con artists pull off. With the new information about the tan vehicle, police did receive a lot of new leads and tips. A local car detail shop contacted FBI and let them know that a guy had come in the morning after Michael's death with that same type of car with a tan Mazda and he requested that he get the car cleaned out and detailed and one thing that really stood out to them that they thought was really freaky was that he asked them if they could clean out some animal blood that was in his trunk or he called it hunting blood girl i would have been up in my office like on the phone dialing 911 at that like hunting what what was you hunting you know what i'm saying like uh uh girl uh um investigators were very very curious about who this person was because obviously you know that's weird okay they gave investigators the license plate number and so investigators were able to look it up the car was registered to a 39-year-old Zachary Persets. 
his ass is in trouble. Now, Zachary Persitz, he was an acquaintance of Michael's. His wife and Michael's wife, Helen, actually knew each other and that's how he and Zachary met. They met in the Russian community. A lot of people loved Zachary. They described Zachary as a very trustworthy person, a very nice, you know, kind of soft guy. They said that Zachary was very much into music and the arts and he played the piano and he was just not that much of a loud guy you know he was kind of quiet and just a really nice guy like no one could imagine Zachary hurting a fly famous last words right now Zachary he didn't have this huge amazing mansion or house like Michael did his house although he had been in the business a lot longer than Michael he worked as a dam inspector for the state of Minnesota with further investigation police discovered that Michael and Zachary were more than just associates and friends they were also doing business together Michael was Zachary's um, financial advisor and Zachary had given Michael over a hundred thousand dollars to invest and at some point Zachary found out that his portfolio was worth less than thirty thousand dollars when police brought Zachary in to interview him they asked him if he would take a lie detector test and he actually agreed to taking the test but he had the test performed by his lawyer and he passed the test although i will say that lie detector tests aren't that accurate so i don't know i'm kind of in between if lie detectors should be used or taken that seriously or not because they're not that accurate believe it or not but i know it's, it's still a good technique it's just not that accurate of a technique i hope you guys can see where i'm going with this look i'm trying to create that a v for like vader also, at that time, forensic scientists were unable to tell the origins of the blood that they found in Zachary's, in the trunk of Zachary's car. So, uh, because at this time, it was 1991, DNA testing technology was not that far advanced. So there wasn't really a lot that they could get from this. In order for them to tell anything at that time, they would have needed DNA that hadn't been put through any type of processes or tests prior to that one but then investigators found something very suspicious on Zachary's car they found that his front bumper had been broken out and there was a piece missing and there was some scrapes also on the bumper of his car it could very well match the theory of someone running into a gate they also found really small specks of paint they were orange colored paint and they thought that they might be able to find something if they put it under a microscope and looked at it. According to the forensic investigators, they were so small, they were the size of a period mark or the end tip of a pencil. At the crime scene, investigators did find specks of orange paint on the gate that had been broken into. Forensic scientists compared the paint chips found at the crime scene on the gate to the paint that was found on Zachary's car. They used a process called a solubility analysis. It's a chemical reagent that causes some sort of reaction on the paint chips, like sometimes it will change colors or what like calls the paint chips to swell up or become disfigured and out of place and that kind of tells them from that they'll be able to tell if they're the same paint chips if the paint chips are similar then that shows the investigators that they may have came from the same source right this time i wish i had a red eyeliner but i have a red lip liner can you use a lip liner on a eyes i don't know now the paint test did come back and it showed that the paint that was found on Perset's car could definitely be the paint that was on the gate at the crime scene. However, the sample was so small that the test came back inconclusive, so they weren't able to tell for sure. So they really couldn't do anything with that, but the piece of bumper that they found at the gate, they were able to do something with. Next, forensic investigators compared the piece of plastic that they found at the crime scene to the piece of plastic that was missing from Zachary's bumper. And what do you know? They matched. The pieces fit into each other like a puzzle, which was pretty miraculous seeing as how 
the pieces were unevenly broken. With further investigation, police discovered that Zachary owned a dog with long hair that was similar to the hair they found at the crime scene. When they compared the microscopic hair that they found at the crime scene to Zachary's dog's hair, they found the hair to be very consistent with each other and a possible match. Then investigators sprayed Zachary's car with luminol and it revealed a massacre of blood splatter. I mean, it looked like they compared it to tiny little stars on the roof of his car. Like, that's pretty effed up. And it was like on the headlight of the car as well, which was right over the driver's seat of the car. According to the blood splatter and forensic evidence that they found, Michael would have been sitting in the front driver's seat of the car. The blood splatter pattern was consistent with a high velocity impact of some sort. So basically, it was consistent with a gunshot wound. All the forensic evidence pointed to Michael sitting in the driver's seat of Zachary Persett's car when they got to the destination. This led police to theorize that Zachary most likely held Michael at gunpoint, told him to get into the car, and told him to drive to the location. Oh, how terrifying. I mean, he had to know what was gonna happen next. And can you just imagine driving yourself to where you know you're about to be killed? Like, that is so terrifying. I feel like I would've got that money that night. I feel like I would've somehow got his money that night. I would've dug into my own account, I mean, Michael must not have been that rich himself because why he couldn't just go into his own personal account and give Zachary the money? Investigators also found a receipt in Zachary Persett's office for handcuffs. What were you gonna use those for, dude? This was enough evidence for them to go ahead and make an arrest because who the hell carries handcuffs around that's not the police? okay or not security and in their office at work like unless you're into some i don't know what you're into but that's probably not appropriate at the office okay sir <laughs> zachary persitz was arrested and charged with first degree murder prosecutors theorized that zachary was pissed because michael was doing shady ish with his money okay investing them in this poor you know investment schemes and now Zachary's money had dwindled down from a hundred thousand dollars to below thirty thousand. Zachary was basically watching his money dwindle down and seeing Michael get you know new cars and stuff and Michael was doing really well so Zachary was pissed about this. Also at home his wife was giving him a lot of issues about the fact that you know why Michael and Helen had a better house and car than they did. Zachary's wife did hang out with Michael's wife, Helen, so she would oftentimes see what Michael and Helen had, and you know, they were big show-offs. If you add the combination of him losing his money, okay, and his wife also pressuring him and on his back about the fact that they didn't have money, I don't condone what he did, but I can kind of understand where his anger was coming from, you know what I mean? I wouldn't kill nobody for it, but I might hurt somebody for it. Also, Zachary had two children that he needed to send to primary school and he wasn't going to be able to pay for that. He was late on bills. He had missed mortgage payments. I mean, Michael was really effing with people's lives out here. So basically, Zachary was watching all of his dreams vanish before him because he gave Michael a chance with his accounts, with his money, and he just he couldn't handle the pressure of all of his his world falling apart while watching the man who took his money and basically screwed him over rise to the top it was like too much for him mentally prosecutors believe that this was the motive behind michael's death zachary persitz did all of that but he didn't take into consideration the forensic evidence he left behind such as the paint marks he left on the fence when he broke through it, as well as the tiny pieces from his bumper that were found later. He also didn't take into consideration the dog hair he left behind on the tarp that he had wrapped Michael's torso in. In court, Zachary Persis pleaded not guilty for reason of insanity, but the jury wasn't buying it. Thanks to forensic science and some good police work, Zachary Persis was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life 
in prison. But in 2010, at the age of 59, while serving his life prison sentence, Zachary took his own life. Prison officials found him hanging in his cell. What do you guys think about this case and my makeup look? Please let me know in the comments down below. If you like videos like these, you can check out my last episode. I'll leave a link on the screen right here or right here. Like, comment, subscribe, and share. Please share because it really helps me out. And I'll see you guys next week with another episode. Bye.